Heads up, this game references drug abuse quite a bit. Drugs are a central part of both the narrative and combat system, and I fully understand if that means this video isn't for you. Their inclusion is likely to limit or remove any chances I have of monetizing this video, so please check out the Patreon link in the description. At a glance, Galarians looks like just another Resident Evil clone, only this time with psychic powers. Now, there's some merit to that, but Galarians has a lot going on that makes it an entirely separate beast, with its own tone and gameplay loop. Sure, we have fixed camera angles, tank controls, and some attempts at horror, but where Resident Evil locked you in a fairly large and open environment with a host of monsters, Galarians has a much more aggressive pace through a series of smaller, linear stages where it often feels like you're the monster. You can pull up a map at any time by pressing circle where experienced gamers will immediately see the routes they have to take. I had this open for the majority of my playthrough out of sheer convenience. Very rarely did it obscure anything important in the environment. It felt much better than having to go to a separate screen and menu a la RE. I could just glance at it for quick reference while still playing. I didn't have to constantly interrupt myself. There's not as much backtracking as you might expect, with many rooms only requiring a single visit. The big exception to this is the hotel, which takes up the entire second disc, despite only focusing on a handful of rooms. It's a bit of a pace breaker which I'll be discussing further in just a bit. Once the stage is beaten and you've moved on to the next one, you can't go back. It provides a nice sense of forward momentum driven by the plot. There are a few puzzles, but they tend to be rather basic. It's rare you'll be doing anything more complex than finding a key for a locked door, even once those keys start taking the form of other objects. You can also scan the environment using Triangle, which will usually flash an image of the key's location or provide a glimpse of the puzzle's solution. There are even instances, such as the very first locked door in the first room of the game, where scanning is the solution. As a heads up, there are several instances where you need to interact with the same object multiple times in a row, such as this jewellery box where you have to insert your mother's ring, then open it, then take your father's ring from inside it, then close it, and then take your mum's ring back out of the lock again. Interactions can be kind of clunky and unintuitive like this at times. Exploration and puzzles are seemingly downplayed because of a much greater focus on combat. You'll often be in situations where every exit's locked until all enemies in the area are dead, so you can't always run past or away from foes, and the entire final level is a gauntlet of fights. This is where Galarians really sets itself apart, but also stumbles. Our main character, Rion, has psychic powers. You can knock people to the floor with Nalcon, pretty much your standard go-to for most encounters. You can set enemies on fire with the creatively named Red. Yeah, someone took an early lunch that day, but this power easily does the most damage. Or you can lift those up before slamming them into the ground with the Felon. Great for crowd control as the only move which targets multiple enemies. Your powers are a limited resource, you need to keep them topped up, and here's where the drugs come into play. Rion has to inject himself to refill his abilities. Think of the vials as a clip or magazine for a gun, and you're basically there. Having and using these psychic weapons comes at a cost. They place strain on Rion. You have anger points, which constantly build over time. The bar fills up even faster if you use your powers or take damage. Once the bar's full, attempting to aim triggers a short. Rion's powers go haywire, Every enemy who gets too close gets a sudden, violent death, but your movement speeds reduce to a crawl and your health constantly depletes. The only way to stop a short is to take a Delmeter pill. Sadly, these are a limited resource, taking up a slot in your inventory. The approach to item management here has pros and cons. On the plus side, it doesn't require its own screen. Keys and files are sorted separately into an infinite bank, so you won't be running between item chests. Meanwhile, your syringes, recovery items, and other pills go into a 12-slot pouch, which is double what your average RE character can carry. The downside is ammo doesn't stack, and with no item boxes, you often have to use a drug early to pick up more of it, or risk coming back for it later. If you're not careful when managing your inventory, the game can become impossible to win. 
If you run out of syringes, you won't be able to fight back or clear mandatory battles. If you run out of Delmeter, your next short, which is inevitable, will be fatal. 12 slots to carry top-ups for free power sets, HP recovery pills, and Rion's Delmeter prescription soon runs out, and that's without including the other drugs you can pick up and use. Apolina instantly induces a short. Shorts can be a useful way to cheese harder battles, and it's the only way I could beat these three goons in this tiny hotel room. Trying to fight them normally continually sent me straight to the game over screen. Problem is, there only seems to be one Apolina pill in the entire game, which some players save for this area in the final level. Personally, I got lucky and just happened to naturally be on the verge of shorting when I got here, otherwise I'd have had a tough battle on my hands. You can also find Skip. These tablets increase Rion's power level. They're incredibly rare to the point Rion's happy to take them from a derelict toilet, and you can stack two of them to get up to level 3. At higher levels, your attacks charge more quickly and do more damage, making them borderline essential for boss fights. Your level drops if you go under 50% health, and I often found myself using recovery capsules, which are a full heal, when I was only at around 60% because I prioritised keeping my power level up. You can see the ingredients for an involving risk-reward battle system where the player's constantly making informed decisions while being fully engaged. Frustratingly, the execution really lets the game down on that front. The scarcity of a Polinar means it's not a factor, and the difficulty of maintaining level 3 powers incentivized me to reset if I got knocked under 50% health. D Felon doesn't show up at all until stage 3 of 4 on disc 2 of 3, with the only top-ups being found in the last level, making it too absent for consideration. I initially hoped these powers would play into the puzzles too. When I doused a door with liquid explosive, I tried to set it alight with red, but it didn't work. Instead, I had to scan it to trigger a cutscene. Likewise, when I read the description for D Felon as, to quote the manual, form an anti-gravity field around an object, I assumed I'd need to levitate some crates around to reach a window or something, but no such puzzle ever appeared. It feels like there's wasted potential there, a missed opportunity to synergize the mechanics of the puzzles and exploration with the powers used in combat. Then there's the fact that the battle systems simply don't work as intended. Powers can absolutely fail to find their target, causing you to waste precious vials. Enemy pathfinding regularly and consistently traps them on pieces of the environment, making them easy prey. Meanwhile, there are mechanical suits that can easily catch you in a loop. They throw you to the ground, walk over to you, and throw you again the moment you stand up. Speaking of, those mechs are seemingly immune to red, but this is poorly communicated causing you to waste even more resources. It seems like some of the bosses also have strengths and weaknesses, but again, good luck figuring those out on your own. The boss encounters in particular are a bit of a sore point for me. It feels like they were designed for an entirely different game with a much more flexible control scheme. Rita's easily the worst offender here. She levitates on a table, during which she's invulnerable. She throws an infinite supply of chairs at you, I don't know where she's getting these from, and she swoops down at you herself. The idea is to dodge her projectiles, make her crash, and counterattack while she's grounded. That would be fine if the tank controls and fixed camera angles didn't make dodging so difficult. The opening to counterattack Rita gets shorter and shorter as the fight goes on, but your attacks all require at least some charging before you can fire them, meaning you often need to be ready to hit her before she's even landed. While this setup would be fine in most other games, here it's simply asking too much for the tools the player has to hand. Thankfully, Rita's vulnerable to D Felon, but even saving the only set the game gives you up to this point, and having my power level maxed out, it's still not enough to take her down. I still had to follow up with some well-timed shots of red. Most bosses are also immune to shorting, so you can't just fall back on that either. I was lucky to even have those resources, as Rita follows very shortly after another boss in the same stage, Reinhardt. This guy can send flames flying everywhere, summon lava zombies, 
and teleport straight to you for physical attacks. Knowing Rita was next, I fought him conservatively, but I could see a newcomer going all out and then having nothing left to battle Rita with. This is the kind of design that means you should probably make multiple save files and save often. There are no ink ribbons or rankings here, there's no one to impress, do yourself a favour. Strangely, these two are harder than the bosses in the finale. The second stage of the penultimate boss can be bested by standing still while firing Nalcon. The final boss itself can be beaten by sitting in a corner and spamming red. I'm not even sure the end boss knew I was in the room. Rita and Reinhardt are big contributions to the reason the hotel is quite possibly the game's worst level overall. See? I told you I'd come back to this one. The game ditches the largely linear but interesting and varied layouts of stages 1 and 2 in favour of 12 borderline identical hotel rooms across two floors. Where previous levels had actual puzzles and items to collect, the hotel has a series of disconnected events, where a resident will ask you to go to one of the vacant rooms, you'll be ambushed by enemies, and you return to find that resident's been murdered. Rinse repeat until the boss decides he's ready to fight you. That's assuming the other guests will even talk to you. Half of them start out with an oddly pre-rendered cutscene that uses in-engine assets where they brush you off before eventually warming up to you enough to make their request. There's absolutely no reason given for their transitions, it happens entirely off screen. It's actually so aimless with the next step so unclear that I often just found myself going room by room, floor by floor, looking for the next thread to pull on. It was overall a really disjointed experience. It also has this weird part where you have to knock on a door with a specific rhythm. I'd class myself as musically challenged, so this took more attempts than I care to admit. The person who teaches you to knock disappears after you hear it just once, so I had to watch my own footage back to listen to the timings again. Obviously, I have a very rare use case where I could actually do that. I imagine it would be a massive problem for a normal player if they were reloading a save they hadn't touched for a week. The only other time the game's this obtuse is when exploring Rion's home. There's a hole in the floor you have to jump over, but you'll grab the ledge and fall every time. What you're supposed to do is mash the cross button to pull yourself up, but you're never told that. I admittedly had to look up the solution online and groaned when I saw it. I don't understand how the hotel takes up the entire second disc. The first two areas were bigger and better, yet they shared disc one. They even had more space consuming FMVs. I wish I could say the final level picks up the slack, but as I mentioned earlier, that's a short linear gauntlet of battles. The game really does lose steam in its second half. That said, I did enjoy my playthrough and I would recommend checking it out. Visually and stylistically, this is a real treat. My teenage corn, Slipknot and Linkin Park adoring self drank up this game's gothic cyberpunk vibe back in the day. In fact, they made an OVA called Galarian's Rion that retells the story with brand new animation and a good chunk of the cover is dedicated to mentioning the early 2000s me soundtrack. The story is kind of tropey, but it's played straight, takes itself seriously, and is just the right degree of warped and messed up to really appeal to me. You'll notice a complete lack of synopsis or spoilers here, simply for the fact that I'd prefer you to go in as fresh as possible. One word of warning, sometimes cutscenes glitched out with these large blotches. I'm not sure if this is my old disc, a side effect of playing this on a PS3 over HDMI, or something else entirely. Turning the game off and on again did seem to fix it though. I genuinely think this game better handles some parts of the Resident Evil formula than its inspiration does. Not having to go to a separate screen to see the map, inventory, or your health greatly boosts the user experience through sheer speed and convenience of obtaining vital information. Sure, it's confused about whether it wants to be a psychological horror or a psychic power fantasy, and the execution's definitely a little sloppy, but for the 4 hours and 45 minutes it took me to beat, maybe round that up to 5.5 including deaths, I'd say any classic RE fan should check this out. 
this game did get a sequel, Galarian's Ash, and I remember excitedly buying it because I couldn't believe that obscure PS1 game I liked actually got a follow-up. Sadly, I've never finished it, and I remember hating it at the time, thinking they'd ruined the franchise. But that was a good 17 years ago, and my tastes and opinions may have changed since, so it's definitely worth a revisit. That game also has mature themes, so any video about it is unlikely to be deemed advertiser-friendly. I do have a Patreon account where you can directly support the channel, and I'd greatly appreciate anyone who signs up. You can also support the channel by subscribing, commenting, liking the video, and sharing it with your friends and family.